Hey everybody, Mark G here again with another video to uh, this time talk about some Green Beret stuff. Um, I'm a retired Green Beret. I was in the 10th Special Forces Group, ultimately retired though out of U.S. SOCOM. Um, and today is the 20th anniversary of the most significant battle I was ever in, for sure, in my time in the military and one of the most historic special operations I think ever done uh, called Operation Viking Hammer, which was a piece of a larger concept called Task Force Viking. Um, today I'm gonna walk you through it on a map um, and just to show you um, where it happened, how it went down, at least for me um, and my SF team, which is called an ODA, Operational Detachment Alpha. Uh, so I'm going to walk through the battle blow by blow a little bit, kind of like I did in my book, if you're interested in reading the blow by blow and all the background. My book's called One Green Beret, um, and it kind of details this all out. Um, quick backdrop, um, background on on uh, the whole situation. You know, it was 2003 time frame, um, you know, Saddam Hussein, you know, history of just badness, you know, the whole narrative around possible WMD and all that stuff. Uh, I don't really care about any of that political crap. Um, I'm going to give you my team's perspective and my personal experience real quick. So my team got a mission that is kind of a very special mission to receive if you're a Green Beret, kind of like a Super Bowl type moment for Green Berets, um, where we were going to go into northern Iraq early, uh, organize the Kurds, or more, more so actually figure out where they are, and basically take out a couple terrorist groups and then focus our efforts on uh, the Iraqi military that was along the Green Line. So um, bottom line for me was my team suited up in early January 2003. Um, I'm not going to talk details of how we got into northern Iraq. Um, but let's just say we got in there, um, linked up with the Kurds. The KDP brought us over the border, basically, uh, or not over the border, but from the border to link up with the PUK. So the KDP were the Kurds. Um, so the Kurds used to be broken into two factions. They might still be. I don't know. Uh, I write code for a living now. I don't do this stuff anymore. But if you take northern Iraq, kind of this area, I'm, you know, moving my mouse around and split it into two pieces. Um, you got the KDP up here, the PUK down here. My team's, you know, mission was to link up with the PUK. Um, so what we did is we ended up doing a 27-hour rental car ride um, into Iraq, all the way across northern Iraq, and ultimately found ourselves north of um, Suleimania here um, in, a, in a place where we'd been set up to live in like a house with some Kurds. Uh, by the way, when Green Berets go in and do this kind of like Super Bowl moment stuff, you're totally living off of the, uh, we were totally living with the Kurds. We were, there was no bases. We had basically no support. Um, if stuff went wrong, we were hosed. Uh, but we ended up in this place called Kuala Chalan, which I can't find here. By the way, I didn't pre-plan any of this very well to give you guys this brief, but there's a, there it is right there, Kuala Chalan is where we ended up hanging out to, to accomplish a few things before the rest of essential, before the war started, basically. So our team's missions were to, one, figure out where all the Kurds are um, and do an analysis of what we call composition disposition. Um, and really like a capability assessment. So where are the Kurds? What do they have? What are their capabilities? Um, and just kind of try to understand that. Now we're talking about a hundreds 
maybe even thousands of square kilometers of area to cover here with very limited roads. So we spent a lot of time driving for hours and hours a day, linking up with different Kurdish elements. Some didn't like us um, and just trying to capture where they are. And the reason why we're doing that is to know kind of what we had at our, uh, for lack of a better word, disposal to use against the Iraqis and these terrorist groups up here. Um, and also to figure out once all the other Green Berets come in, where are we going to put them? So this part of the mission is called um, Reception, Staging, Onward Movement, and Integration, which is basically figure out where folks are going to go. Then when they show up on the ground, you basically get them to those places that you've laid out. You give them some kind of assessment of who they're going to be working with from the Kurdish leadership side and stuff like that. Um, so that was a big thing. Another thing we had to do is we had to fix the Asulamania airstrip to make sure that it could handle um, large U.S. aircraft, you know, possibly landing on it. Let me make sure my house isn't burning down. Um, so, you know, that was down here, a little bit west of Halabja, right here, is where we were, uh, you know, making sure that runway was going to work. So every day, you know, we'd be driving all the way down here, and then I was personally um, responsible for areas that went all the way out to this place called Tok Tok, which was on the green line, not Tik Tok, Tok Tok, um, which I can't even find here. Uh, but if you, if you follow what used to be the green line over, um, you'll be able to find it. Let me, let me do another quick backup for a second. So again, zoom out to Northern Iraq here. You've got back then this thing called the Green Line, which was essentially the forward line of troops of the Iraqis against the Kurdish um, groups up in the north. And it was roughly about this big. And actually, there's Tok Tok right there. That's what I was, that's what I was talking about. Um, so my sector personally was like from there over to here and then something like that. Huge area. Um, and each like couple guys on my team had a similar type of area of responsibility. Um, I'm not saying like I did it all myself in that thing. I had help. I was a dumbass then. So my, you know, my captain and team sergeant were awesome and coached me through a lot of it. Uh, but anyway, that was kind of my AO. Um, also the green line was running kind of across here. Uh, but over here on this side near uh, Halabja, which, by the way, Halabja is where Saddam gassed the Kurds and killed tens of thousands of them um, in the 80s. You should read about it. It's, hor it's horrendous. Um, so if you're talking about WMD, like, well, I mean, if that's considered WMD, then there was probably WMD. But anyway... I don't know. Ker Kermal was a place, too, where we had other terrorist groups. So Sargat, uh, Biara, Kermal, this whole area right here was infested by three groups of bearded whack jobs called Ansar al-Islam, IGK, which is Islamic Group of Kur Kurdistan, and then the IMK, which was the Islamic Movement of Kurdistan. And they were three different groups um, that were kind of uh, connected in here, geographically anyway, uh, and kind of nestled into the mountain. Total, total safety, kind of like the Tora Bora, I guess, of northern Iraq. Um, so anyway, just imagine this type of environment where you're like one SF team, um, you're coming in here, you're essentially low visibility, trying to drive around. These terrorist groups are also out there, you know, making threats against us. Um, and we were, we were housed out of Kuala Chilon. So eventually we actually moved down to live right next to, not right next to, but somewhere around here. I don't remember exactly where, uh, but we lived with the Kurdish um, Peshmerga in like their kind of headquarters building. 
which we we called you know ASW, the Sylvania West. Um, I think we we called it that, and uh, we started doing our ops out of there, which was a lot easier than trying to drive all the way down from from up here. Um, um, yeah. So anyway, that was kind of the lay of the land. One time, the IGK group actually attacked our um, our Kurdish headquarters while we were in it, and the Kurds, you know, just smoked these guys at the front gate. So, you know, we were we were in a pretty interesting situation, kind of a classic Green Beret mission of um, being being in there and trying to get the the uh, locals to fight to fight for us and with us um okay so fast forward a couple months january goes by february 2003 and then um march 2003 march is actually at the end of march this today 20 years ago is when we launched operation viking hammer but before we launched that there was another significant app you know happening called the ugly baby if you that's what it's called nowadays. To us, it was just a bunch of dudes coming in. But so my team and a couple others had already been there. We set up all the, you know, we did our assessment. We knew where all the teams were going. We had kind of a, you could call it like an intel package for each team to hand off when they showed up. We literally had buses and, you know, taxi cabs and stuff to get the teams out to their actual guerrilla team locations. Um, but those poor bastards, uh, that flew in made me really glad that I didn't fly in. So they flew, I think it was from Jordan all the way across, uh, Iraq. Some of them shot up significantly. One of them had to actually land in Turkey, but these two planes came, you know, a couple of aircraft came into our airstrip and another one up in this area. I actually don't remember where this team these guys came in up here was second battalion 10th group down here was third battalion 10th group i was third battalion uh bravo company you know zero eight one um so from my point of view and my teams uh the you know the planes landed on the Suleimania airstrip here in the middle of the night they were shot up leaking fuel <laughs> right before the um aircraft landed i was actually the 18 bravo on the team at that time which was the weapons guy um and i was in charge of security for the airstrip so we like blocked off the roads traffic was backed up for miles um and then some young dumb curd you know fired off an rpg round by mistake so he had an accidental discharge with an rpg that doesn't happen every day and then something happened with our generators. So all the lights on the runway went off. Um, so think about this, where you got teams that snuck into a country, organized the Kurds, prepped for an airfield landing, other Green Berets flying in terror, being shot at, have been flying for hours over, you know, AAA machine gun fire, coming in for their final landing and the lights are all out and then rpg goes off so the pilots are afraid that the um, airstrip's not secure a lot of drama let's put it that way and then there was something going on which i don't know exactly how this happened but our air force so we had an AFSOC guy with us who was awesome special tactics squadron dude and he um felt the need to jump in a Jeep Cherokee and drive all the way up the end of the runway. We were all down here on this side of the runway. Let me make sure I'm over here because I think my head might be in the way. Um, yeah, we were all kind of huddled up. I think it was down here and the planes were coming in and this Air Force guy is like, they got to know where the runway is. I, I don't know why he needed to do that. I figured they had night vision or whatever, but what? anyway, the dude pulled off something pretty awesome where he, he drove down the runway, and as the planes were approaching, he's driving down the runway 
flashing his lights or something and talking to them to try to help them identify exactly where to land on the runway. Um, so it was, it was, it was dramatic to say the least. And anyway, eventually, you know, these other green berets landed, um, the smell of jet fuel was intense. You know, it was possible that the things could explode and you see dudes pouring out the back of the, you know, I, rem I remember distinctly watching guys running off the back of the planes, you know, tailgate and then kissing the ground to, uh, you know, just happy to be on the freaking ground. So anyway, everything at that point went fairly decently. Um, we found out at that moment that no, none of the teams had ever gotten any intel that any of us had ever sent back. So that was awesome. Uh, but like great green berets, they were like, where do you need us to go? And where, what's, how are we going to get there? We pointed them at a, at a vehicle, handed them a packet and they were all smiles and friggin' went on their way in the middle of the night in a friggin' foreign land with really, you know, all kinds of threats just all around us. So anyway, it was amazing how they, how we, how we pulled it off. So the next day, I personally and the rest of my team headed down to Halabja. So we had basically successfully set up the environment up here and got the, the Green Berets into their, um, you know, into their units for their to be integrated into the Kurdish um, Peshmerga fighting force, which is, I think, like 40 or 50,000. Folks, I mean, basically, we had just infilled our people to integrate and and build a you know indigenous army. I'm, I'm I'm hyperbolic a little bit with that, but it's I don't know. It's hard not to overstate it. Um, so anyway, my team then headed. We headed west over to Halabja because the time had come now that we're going to start whooping some of these terrorist groups' ass. That was the. That was what we needed to do. So what, what we didn't want to have happen here is that, and my commanders were awesome about doing all this. Like I was just executing, but they set all this up. Um, you should you should do some research on the things they did. So remember the Green Line um, and the Iraqi army was actually the primary mission of Iraq, but we didn't want to start attacking the Iraqis along the Green Line down in here. Um, actually, it would have been down here more um, without taking out this threat to our kind of rear as we did that. So we didn't want, there were roughly a thousand of these Ansar al-Islam guys and IGK and IMK. And if we would have started engaging Iraqi army before taking those guys out or, or significantly degrading them, we would have been in trouble. So Anyway, that was the plan. We're going to schwack these terrorist groups um, or at least disperse them. And then we're going to head out to the Green Line and, and whoop the Iraqis. So that was the plan. So we rolled down to Halabja um, and we stayed. I don't exactly know where here. The, the map's not great. But we stayed in another Kurdish uh, kind of headquarters area in Halabja uh, and planned Operation Viking Hammer. Um, in the days prior to actually launching the attack, we did a couple different uh, continuous missions against Ansar Islam. One, we did reconnaissance. So we went out with Kurds, kind of the edge of their territory. By the way, these terrorist group territories were explicit. They were literally dug in. They had flags flying, checkpoints on roads, so this wasn't like some small uh, group of people that are just blended into some population. They had totally taken over these areas to the west of Halabja. So it was their territory, you know, from their perspective. So we did reconnaissance. We also did mortaring. Uh, so we took out mortars. We also built mortars out of kind of spare parts the Kurds had. We called them Franken mortars. Um, and we, we mortared different positions every day, kind of like harassment. Uh, we also, one time my team did a kind of penetration little mission to do some sniper 
ops with, uh, you know, it was actually a really stupid thing to do. I don't know what good it would have ever done, but we might have just done it because it would have been cool. I don't remember. So anyway, we drove down about a kilometer and a half inside of Onstar territory with only about five or six of us. Uh, we had a Barrett 50 cal, um, and we were going to try to pop some rounds off on this one big uh, kind of, it was kind of like a pillbox type position up on a hilltop, um, and, you know, take some pot shots at it. We ended up getting fired on by like three different angles from heavy machine guns pinned down for a little while. Then they started lobbing mortars at us. Um, me and this guy named Chris, um, had a had a 120 mortar land like super close to us it took kind of our breath away and then we ran down this gorge to kind of exfil out of there it was a big deal meanwhile kurds were firing mortars to kind of cover us to get out of there so um, a little incursion happened uh, that was not really insignificant um, even prior to viking hammer okay then um i'll just fast forward to this day 20 years ago, which was when we really launched Operation Viking Hammer, which was um, about, well, let me let me try to describe this moment in a in a way that is conveys kind of the scale of this thing. Um, hold on a second, let me let me back out of here a little. All right. Um, imagine, pitch, picture this for a second. You've got uh, a whole enclave of terrorists. Um, for the last three months, you've been trying to rally people to fight against them. And then suddenly the day comes where all these people show up. And we're talking about, it was, you know, numbers vary and some are exaggerated. I would say it was between 5,000 and 8,000 Kurdish Peshmerga show up to fight on this day. So you're talking about people rolling in on buses, in dump trucks, uh, in taxi cabs, in like little clown car like vehicles with like 10 dudes in it, motorcycles, you, you name it, horses and donkeys, any way people can get to the fight that's like they're just showing up out of nowhere. You know, it's like a tailgate party or something. Um, different teams. Uh, so actually, let me back up for just a second. So Viking Hammer was organized into prongs of attack. Um, There's like the yellow prong, red prong, orange prong, and, and some other ones. I was, I don't even remember them all, but I was on the yellow prong. Um, and each prong roughly had a thousand Kurds essentially attached to it. Um, so as I'm driving, our kind of rally point for my yellow prong team, you know, we went from Halabja headquarters here and drove out to this place called Dekan, somewhere around here. Uh, let me actually turn on some imagery here. Out here near Dekan is where we... Um, we linked up. So as I'm driving out here with my teammates and I'm sitting in the back of a truck, uh, you know, those little like Nissan trucks sitting in the back, looking over the front. And as we approach in the, in the morning hours or just, just becoming daylight, I see like this sprawling horde of Kurds just collecting out here on the kind of this, it's almost like a prairie like, uh, environment here. So it's gotta be a thousand people at least. Um, and you know, we, we, as we drive up and we start kind of parting the crowd where it's kind of like we're rock stars rolling in, you know, everybody's like cheering. Uh, the Kurds really get excited about air support. Um, so, they were pumped, let's put it that way. Um, so we kind of got off the trucks, merged into our our Kurds. We knew most of these guys. We were like buddies. Uh, by the way, some of them could speak German because they did migrant work. I'm a fairly decent German speaker, so I was able to converse with some of these guys. 
and we're talking and just getting ready to go. There's this huge flatbed uh, truck, probably like a five ton flatbed with a ZSU 23-4 or 2 mounted on the back, which is, that's an anti-aircraft gun, mounted to the back of a pick of a truck. Uh, and I seem to remember that thing being kind of the signal to charge. Um, in my book, I, I struggled to like describe this moment. It's super, it's so massive in scale, it's hard to actually convey the, the significance of it. So to me, it was similar to scenes in like Braveheart with these massive hordes of people super pissed off and ready to kick ass. And then the signal to charge, you know, is executed and then people head for the hills and they start friggin' whooping ass. So that the moment when that happened to me was when this old Kurd jumped up on that flatbed truck, dialed in the ZSU and started firing the thing towards the ridge. So let me talk, this is the ridge I'm talking about right here. Actually, let me make sure that's the ridge. Yes, it is. So when we were standing over here, um, this ridge right here had Ansar Islam guys standing on top of it in like a line. I don't know how many, 20, 30, 50. I didn't count them. But I'll tell you, that was a pretty eerie feeling. You know, you're standing down here. You're looking up, basically looking at the enemy. There's basically zero cover and concealment, and you're about to just charge, essentially, to uh, to move out. So we did have one uh, run from an aircraft come in and bomb this ridge. Um, but really, as the plane was coming in, the Onsar guys kind of just ran away. The bombs hit, and then they, they were right back up there. Uh, and then and back to, I know I'm all over the place here. Bear with me. I'm getting goosebumps, by the way. The shit brings back memories. So old Kurd fires off ZSU, lights up side of Ridge. Massive scream of warriors start just kind of oozing towards the mountains in this giant horde. Um Pickup trucks are kind of integrated with people on the ground. There was a couple dump trucks full of people that was kind of like your guerrilla version of armored personnel carriers. And essentially, we headed to what I think is this road um, right near here. And we, you know, we kind of navigated through here. Um, at this point, we had members of the green prong and the yellow prong. So let me go high level here for a second. The yellow prong was my team, and we're going to go up this valley. Right? Actually, that's the wrong valley. Hold on. Yeah, this is this was our objective for my team, Sargat, which, by the way, I did not explain to you something very important. So in the earlier days of deciding whether to attack Iraq, um, it was known that there was a chemical and biological weapon, um, you know, compound here where Ansar Islam was cooking up some bad, like juju over here. These maps are super new compared to them, but right down near the base of this hill is where that, um, facility was. So my team's mission the yellow prong that I was on was to get to Sargat. So, you know, again, back to here, we went from here to roughly here. You know, actually probably more like here. And as we passed this ridge, our green prong, which was our kind of like fire support element was going to go along this ridge to our North. Um, so my team personally, my ODA 081 was split into two teams. So we had a few guys that were going on the green and then a few guys were going on the yellow. Uh, my uh, engineer who had a Barrett 50 cal was going up this way and my warrant officer and another dude named Malcolm. I can't remember if anybody else. I think it was those three going up this ridge with another team from Charlie Company, uh, 310. 
or Alpha Company. No, Charlie, Charlie Company. Um, and then my team started its basically infill uh, into this valley to go to go up. I wonder if I can do 3D mode on this. That would be cool. Yeah. Look at that shit. All right. So, yep, we drop off the green prong, and they, that might not be a great way to describe it, but first thing we, we start doing is traversing. I'm going to go back to 3D mode. That looked cool, but wasn't super useful. So we go up, I think it was this road right here, because we we had to go through Gulp, because there was a significant presence there by the way we had red prong people with us too that went up to gulp and they were then going to split off this way so that's kind of how it went high level green prong was dispatched this way yellow and red went up to gulp and then we continued towards sargat as yellow but the red prongers went over here and i don't remember where they ended up biara maybe some to some to read about um Remember, I was just a dude on an SF team. I, di I didn't have a super great grasp of the whole picture, unfortunately. I wish I'd have been more attentive, to be honest. Anyway, just as we came up the valley here, we started coming under fire significantly from pretty much every direction. Um, and we're stuck on this road where bullets are just flying everywhere. Um, hard to describe the the scene so i'm i'm on a bare dirt road uh there are hundreds of kurds surround all around me talking yelling machine gun fire breaks out from at least two different angles people are running in all directions and screaming um, the kurds start immediately attacking in this they're basically running towards the sound of gunfire um, so one of our like key principles of being an SF guy is you got to stay on the front line. We call it the front line trace of your guerrilla elements, because you can't really integrate air power and stuff if you don't know exactly where your forward line of, of troops are. So we were continuously struggling to just stay out in the front with the Kurds the whole time. Um, so anyway, uh, we start, you know, the Kurds are like locusts, like just screaming over the hills and grass, trying to take out these uh, Ansar elements that are firing at us. Meanwhile, I think it was either my captain or my team sergeant called in a airstrike. Uh, we just so happened to have an F-18 on standby. So this F-18, uh, you know, is a unbelievable show of, brutality uh, when this thing comes flying in i don't know how high it was above us felt like it was two feet over my head but that thing dumps 30 millimeter rounds i think that's what f-18 shoot but he was shooting out of his main gun at, at these positions they were firing at us and within not too long either the kurds overtook these positions or the aircraft just annihilated them and soon, pretty soon we were we were in Gulp. Uh, Gulp has like a little village kind of dealio going on. Where there was there was a mosque uh, in Gulp, and I'm trying to find it. Maybe I thought it was. Yeah, I can't I can't find it. But we we ended up coming right up this road. There was a mosque right here somewhere. Um, and there were dead bodies. Oh, there it is right there. There were dead bodies everywhere. You know, at least 15 or 20 kind of scattered along here that the Kurds and us kind of, you know, moved through. So, you know, no no time to waste. Looking, I remember it was cold, by the way. You know, it was it was it was cold that morning. So it was just daybreak. And I, I distinctly remember like wound, you know, people that are freshly killed having like, you know, steam coming off of their wounds, you know, from the, from the, the, the heat and cold. So something, you know, never quite forget. Um, so anyway, my team keeps going up, up the valley here. And again, the red prong heads out this way, not far above gulp. Um, 
Let me let me get oriented a little here. Yeah. Yeah, right? I would say in this dog leg in the road here, up this valley. Let me do 3D real quick and make sure. I'm, yep, that's it. I'm pretty sure. Right in here, as we, by the way, we jumped in the back of a pickup uh, that we also had a Mark 19 and a 50 cow just thrown in the back of. Um, and there were just a horde of Kurds all the, all around us here. And we're, we're poking our way up the road, half on foot, jumping in and out of vehicles, whatever, to kind of keep moving up there. But as we came to right here, we started taking significant fire from the back side of this hill and some of this part in front. Um, we, we actually grabbed the Mark 19 out of the back of the truck. Our team sergeant told us to kind of do a crew drill with it. And we were firing the Mark 19 up into here and kind of either killed or dispersed these guys. Uh, more likely, they just ran that way and the red prong actually engaged them. Um, but we had that little incursion. Then we had, you know, I can't really, there's so many little, you could almost call them little ambushes or firefights along the way to Sargat. I don't know if I should even bother describing them. Let's just say we, we fought our way, um, not on the road the whole time, but up this valley. Sometimes we were way down in the bottom of the valley. Sometimes we were up in it. We were up on the road in, in a truck because the Kurds moved so fast. Um, and there were so many of them that if we were on foot for any amount of time and engaged with the enemy, then elements of the Kurds would get out in front of us. So then we'd have to jump back in vehicles and try to get back out in front of them. Um, so anyway, we, we struggled to get stay on the front line, but we did. Um, and I'm going to kind of get moving here a little bit as we talk through this i'm going to run out of disk space on this video but um now we got up here i would guess somewhere right in here where as soon as we rounded this bend and, and came within any distance of sargat by the way sargat is where the basically the ansar headquarters was so this, there was hundreds of bad guys in sargat so we're rolling up this valley I'm going to see if I can kind of find where we started taking the most withering amount of fire. Um, it was really when we got up to within a few hundred meters, you know, probably you know, a thousand even from Sargat. Um, yeah, actually, I can, I can do something like this. What is this? Yes, yeah, so I would say somewhere around in here. I'm going to clear that measurement. Uh, somewhere around in here is where we started really getting hammered um, with fires of different kinds. So Ansar had like 14.5 millimeter stuff set up, mortars, um, Dishka, 50, you know, basically the Soviet version of a 50 cal, all just hammering this valley as we went up it. Um, and what we, the only thing we really had for any amount of cover were these rows of stone walls. Um, that maybe that's some of them right there, or maybe they were even closer. Yeah, hold on, let me let me get my get my bearing again here. Yeah. So in this area, roughly in here, I would guess, um, is where we were probably you know, pinned down or fighting, you know, to get hundreds of feet at a time for like five or six hours of nonstop, just shoot, move, communicate, screaming, yelling, wounded, mortars, RPG, just total. When you think of war, like that's what it was. Um, so a critical moment that happened was by the way, the green prong was already advancing way up here. The red prong was down there. You know, the the plan was kind of coming together um, fairly decently. So we had this kind of attack uh, working. But the, the problem was for us is that a lot of the, I think the red and green prong had a tendency to push people into Sargat. So we had a big concentration here. 
Um, one pinnacle moment was when they started firing a um, really heavy machine gun at us, and it was it just uh, like a 14.5 or something machine gun. Um, so my captain, by the way, my captain was freaking amazing. Uh, so in my book, I write about this in detail, and I get kind of personal about it. Like there was one moment in this thing where I'm pinned down behind a stone wall with my two other guys who were with me. And there was nowhere to go at one point. Like if we went forward, we were just running into a hail of tracers. We didn't know where right or left even led to. Um, and then going backwards is not an option. So at one point I was in, like, I was seriously scared shitless to the point of almost being frozen. Um, but the one thing I think that broke my trance of being just completely kind of petrified was my captain running from somewhere to my, what was to my right over to me and jumping down next to me with a smile on his face. Uh, by the way, the guy's name is Rowan, Brian Rowan. He's, he was the, he became the 10th special forces group commander, um, later in his life. Amazing guy. I wish I'd have been more, wish I'd have been more helpful to him in hindsight. Um, but anyway, he ran over, um, told us that there's somewhere we can go if we, if we traverse to the right. Um, and then what happened? He dropped his map and left, he left his map with me. He ran away. Then he runs back to get his map. And I have to understand there's like tracers raining sideways everywhere and he's just running back and forth it's lucky he didn't get killed uh, anyway he survived we ended up my my me and my two guys out not there weren't mine but me and the two guys i was with ran over to where he came from and we all ended up consolidating um see the map's different now by the way because things changed in 20 years but i would say roughly somewhere in here we got hunkered down behind a good size portion of stone wall. You know, who knows? Maybe it was one of these things over here. See these walls? Um, or maybe those. And I remember in there was Bafal Talibani was there, who's the son of Jalal Talibani. Um, you know, the, the leader of the PUK and I think became, did he become the president of Iraq? But Heavy, heavy duty guy, awesome British accent. Um, him, uh, my, my captain, um, a couple other like Kurdish that were kind of like commanders of the Kurdish elements. Um, and we kind of hunkered down there for a while. Not hunkered down. I mean, we were taking fire constantly. So then my captain was like, somebody needs to get the 50 cal up to lay down suppressive fire on this basically this this so if you think of sargat as kind of a bowl here let me go to 3d mode again you can see how it's kind of a bowl well we were getting fire from all these little concrete things here it looked roughly like that actually it looks like there's a few more of them now but there were machine gun bunkers in here and they were just pummeling this valley so my captain was like, we got to get somebody up there and suppress the shit. So, uh, and me and the two guys I was with kind of were the ones who were there ready to do it. So what we did is a mad dash um, to get to this hilltop right here. And, I, and if I can find the little divot on top of this, I can tell you exactly where we actually sat in that thing right there see that we so first of all we had to run a couple hundred yards through a hell of bullets then to get to a truck which was i think it was somewhere back here because i remember this fork in the road in this truck we jumped in this truck because it had the 50 cal and the ammo in the back when we jumped into it I didn't drive. It was my, you know, medic we called Happy Gilmore, um, who drove. Our comms guy, who was a beast, jumped in the back. I jumped in the driver's seat, and we drove the truck up to roughly, I think, right here. 
and then let me make sure you can see that and then we on foot ascended this hill my comm sergeant guy put the 50 cow on his shoulder like a friggin paperweight i had my m21 um, and i grabbed i slung it and grabbed a couple cans of 50 cow my medic grabbed the um the tripod and um sorry memories and the curd a bunch of courage just showed up and grabbed tons of ammo um so we and then we just sprinted up this freaking hill which was no joke and remember like think of the back the backdrop of this thing total cacophony of death and destruction going on as we did that um so we we run up this hill we set up the 50 cal this little divot gets us a little bit of cover because we're taking fire from over here so if you can you can imagine being on this hill this is kind of our vantage point from up there but there were other vantage points on us whoops from uh, let me get let me get back to let me get back to where it was um yeah over here um yeah that's it and uh anyway it was it was it was kind of one of those moments so our mission here was to like get on this hill set up this 50 find some of these heavy machine guns and freaking take it out uh and long story short that's what we did we got up there we put the tripod down put the 50 on it put the pintle on it I started, I was laying next to the gunner comms guy gets on the, on the 50. Um, I'm trying to spot with the scope on my M21 and we identified this pillbox kind of place with a, with a heavy machine gun firing out of it. And we just hammered it. I think we put, I don't know, four or 500 rounds through this thing. And I, I remember watching the, the rounds just going through it. You know, then we shifted fire on some other stuff, but it had a huge psychological impact on the battle to have that big gun up there firing and the Kurds seeing that happening. And then that big heavy machine gun stopping from firing because that big heavy machine gun was like a bass drum kicking off in the valley. It was scary. It was freaking, it was extremely scary. Um, so I guess that, you know, I'm not saying like what we did was the deal breaker, but it definitely contributed to the success of taking this, this hill. So I'm watching down below, right down here in front of me. Um, I saw multiple Kurds just get mowed down because we had, we had Kurds coming down this way too and flanking from the right into, into here. And they got, you know, they're getting killed. You know, Kurds are getting I don't know how many of them died, but it wasn't trivial, I'm sure. Um, so we did our thing on this hill, um, and then we, you know, came down off the hill. My medic burned his hand significantly um, on the barrel of the thing. It was so hot when we were as we were trying to get down. So we got down off the hill and hunkered down somewhere right in here. By the way, the chemical facility was basically right here. Um, and so we we had this was a hilarious well it wasn't that hilarious but because we were all kind of you know shell shocked a little bit at this point but we'd been basically running shooting reacting to contact for at this point at least 10 hours um so here when we got down to the bottom of the hill we the Kurds out of nowhere brought us lunch on like a, basically it looked like a platter of like meats for the, you know, the Americans have to eat lunch. So we ate, um, and also uh, the Kurds trucked out wounded right in front of us along this road. Uh, and I'll never forget this because when they were pulling up one of these little hills, blood ran out of the back of one of the trucks, like a river like a little waterfall. Uh, it was just pretty sobering to see that. Um, so 
the battle wasn't over just because we got through Sargat because they were, you know, they, they didn't just stay there. So they were just, they were dispersing up this valley. Uh, Darimar um, was one of the villages that we also needed to clear. And this is all like caves. Yeah, actually, there's a few pictures here on Google. There's like caves um, and stuff like that up in here. And we ended up fighting. Kurds fought through this. Um, meanwhile, the majority of my team actually went up through here all the way out to this other place. And I want to see if I can find. Maybe it was Dharamar. Yeah, I guess it was. Yeah, this is it right here. So we went, we went up this hill on these switchbacks to this top. And here, you know, so we started to think like, man, thank God this, this shit is over. Like, you know, the reality is Green Berets don't become Green Berets because they don't want to see combat. Uh, you actually do. I always tell people, being a Green Beret is like being an NFL player. Uh, but imagine if an NFL player could never play in a game. It would drive them insane. So Green Berets love to see combat, or they want to. It's what they, it's what they live for. But I'll tell you, at this point, we were, we'd had our fill of combat, or at least I had. Um, so anyway, we get up on top of here and again, we start taking massive amounts of fire from positions, um, along this ridge over here. And also just kind of, uh, you know, mostly to this, this front part from what I remember towards Iran, Iran's just over, just, uh, just across the way here, by the way, this is, you know, let's see where, where's the Iranian border. Yeah, there's the Iranian border. So we're we're up here. Right in there. Um we start taking again withering fire. Um bullets are bouncing, you know, two two feet from me, you know, stuff like that. Hardcore stuff. Bafal Talibani and I are pinned down behind this um uh like Land Rover that had a 106 recoilless rifle mounted on it. Um, let's see. I'll bet I can, I might even be able to pinpoint where that was. Uh, it probably changed, but I, I would think it'd be over here somewhere. Cause I don't know if that was there. Um, and uh, anyway, this Kurd is touching off this 106 recoilless rifle, firing it. A 106 recoilless rifle has so much concussion that it can literally injure you. Like your internals can become injured if you don't, if you shoot the thing too much. So this guy must have fired off like 15 rounds um, while Baffle and I were basically right right underneath the breach of the thing. Um, we end up setting up our 50 again, laying down some fire, my team sergeant. Uh, and then my captain called in. Uh, we got an aircraft on station and my captain called in an airstrike from here. And this was almost an extremely horrifying event occurred where let me go into 3D and try to describe this. But we were roughly in here. The green prong was now coming over this way somewhere. You know, by the way, I could be off a little on these statements, but green prong is coming over just as my captain clears the pilot to drop for uh, bombs, uh, the green prong emerges over the ridge where, you know, basically very close to the kill zone of this airstrike. That, but it, it's too late and, and the, the, the stuff's inbound. So four huge bombs hit, death and destruction, all the, you know, pretty much all the fire on us stops. Um, and we're very concerned about friendly fire uh, at that point my captain if i could i can picture his look on his face clearly today uh, the level of concern um so you know the, the the fire stopped on us um and then 
we got radioed back that every actually everyone was okay on the green prong. So the, the green prong then starts sweeping across uh, the front of us and basically cleaning up after the bombs. Um, let's see. I think that was pretty much the end of the day. That was the end of day one at that point. Uh, at this point, by the way, back to more of a strategic context, there were about, so be, let me real quick finish. That was essentially the end of day one, Viking Hammer, except for one more event where uh, we found some missiles and stuff that we, on the way back to Sargat. Um, so what had we done here? Uh, what we what we did was we killed about 300 Ansar Zlom guys. Um, if you look at, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of bodies. Um, but a ton of them actually escaped. So they, they were headed out across the border to Iran. You know, you know they're, the Iran's over here, and they're heading up these valleys. And some are even, there was snow on these peaks, by the way. So you're, you got people post-holing over the mountain. So it, the day one, it becomes dark. We head back to Sargat. Um, and... You know, we're smoked, but we're so, uh, I'll use the term shell-shocked, that it's hard to sleep. I mean, I had a massive headache and felt like total shit. And I think it was because of either the chemical facility, which that was one hunch we had because all of us felt like shit, and, or it was concussion from the 106 being right by my head so, so many times. Um, but I don't know. I felt like shit. But anyway, a lot of us did. So we tried to sleep, but really didn't. Um, the next day, uh, you know, we continued to route Ansar guys out of this, out of the caves here and tracking them down, shooting missiles at them as they tried to cross the border and just kept poking at them all day and distributed groups of Kurds all over the place with us being interwoven in them. Uh, but for me and my medic, we had an extremely harrowing and pretty horrific experience of um, when the, so we, back, back for a second. So back to the chemical facility real quick. The whole purpose of this attack on Sargat was to secure this chemical facility. Um, so the next day arrives this sensitive site exploitation team. Um, to essentially exploit the site that we had captured, which basically means collect intel and stuff out of it. And part of the part of the taskings that we got for doing this, that trickled down to my medic and I was to um, was to walk around and cut hair samples and take pictures of the dead Ansar Islam guys. So. Okay, again, let me, let me back up here. You've, you've got an area roughly this big that is littered with hundreds of bodies. In some areas, there's a body every 10 feet for like football fields of space. So it's like, it's almost like some kind of, I don't know, it's like a, it's like a zombie apocalypse kind of movie because all the bodies are also mangled. Uh, they're shot up, they're burned, they're blown to bits. Uh, Ansar guys were strapped with explosives and they were they were suicide detonating as as we over overtook them. So some of those guys were spread out all over the place. Um, and then, you know, my medic and I just headed out with Ziploc bags scissors and um, a, a digital camera and started cutting hair off dead bodies. And I'll tell you, there is a, there, there's something about, you know, grabbing dead people hair and cutting it off. You're, you're touching them. Okay. And th these are people that are just dis. I mean, these, these people are trying to kill us, obviously. These were freaking psycho people. But still, when they're dead, and the, the carnage and gore 
just uh, really got to us. So I'm just I'm going to leave it at that. I wrote a pretty lengthy uh, description of this in my book. Um, if you're interested in that level of detail, I really don't want to get into it in this video. Um, so we finished that up uh, until we ran out of Ziploc bags. Um, handed that stuff over to the sensitive site exploitation team. And um, for the most part, that was it. That was Operation Viking Hammer. You know, five to 8,000 Kurds, four or five SF ODAs embedded with, 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 uh, with AFSOC and CIA folks embedded with us and the Kurds, distributed across hundreds of square kilometers of land facing roughly a thousand enemy entrenched in the mountains. We killed 300-ish of them, hundreds escaped. Um, so short-sightedness, it was a success. You know, well, but let me switch gears a little bit. People are always asking me if I thought it was effective. I'm like, okay, what, what is, what's, Effective usually has two definitions. You have a near-term requirement that it meets, but it but a long-term strategic impact. So I would say it definitely met the near-term use case of uh, you know eliminating or mitigating threat to our rear as we attack the Iraqis. We definitely dispersed them. We basically blew them up and scattered them all over the place and rendered them largely ineffective uh, for at least a while, which leads to my next definition of effective. If by effective we mean strategically significant over in, the, in terms of like the radical Islamic um, well, well, insurgents or enemy or whatever in, in the area moving forward as Iraq evolved, I would say not really. What, what we did is we dispersed them. Certainly their key leaders didn't stay around to die by our hand. They left to do other bigger and better things from their perspective. And, you know, I, I don't try to keep up with this stuff that much, but in my mind, there's no doubt that these folks escaped into Iran. The ones that had any clout probably made their way down um, to other parts of Iraq. And this is where like Ansar al-Sunnah, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and even ISIS. Um, I cannot imagine that the folks that we disrupted here were not part of the founding of some of those groups. Um, so honestly, like I often wonder if, what would happen if we didn't attack them like that? What if we just like held them off? and isolated them. Who knows? So it, it, I'm always wondering. I think too much. Um, that's one of my problems. But So anyway, um, let's get back to Viking. So Viking Hammer was basically two days, for me anyway, and my team. I think the Kurds kept cleaning house for another few days, but that was generally it for me. Charlie Company stayed there, so they probably did ops that are, I don't even know about. Um. So my team ended up then going out to uh, the green line. Let me turn the regular map back on so I can figure out what I'm looking at. Um, and we ended up going near Kirkuk to Tuz, which maybe I should do another video on this whole epic tale. But we ended up driving from Alabja all the way down to the outskirts of Tuz. Uh, we were actually in this air, uh, in this area right here. I'm trying to see if I can remember any of these names. Darbandi Khan or something was one of them. Man, yeah, I can't, I, I can't remember them. Uh, but we ended up um, taking Tuz. Uh, at the same time, the rest of my company took Kirkuk huge operation. I'll talk about that if I talk about it at all on a different video. So anyway, um, 
a little bit of an overview on Operation Viking Hammer 21 years ago, uh, 20 years ago today. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be alive. So thanks for listening if you hung in there for the whole time. Um, have a good one.